Welcome back, everybody. Give a warm welcome to producer James Lasseter and writer, director, composer, James Samuel. Welcome, James and James. Two um, Jameses. Um, when, I, when I introduced the film, I actually mentioned that I grew up in Latin America watching Saturday morning westerns, but y people of color were not part of the, the picture. And with your film, not only are you educating us, but you're restoring the right place of, of people of color in, in the westerns. Um, for me, first, hey guys, uh, thank you so much for um, being here and watching the, watching the movie. Um, for me, like yourself, I grew up watching westerns and loving um, westerns, like with all my heart. I loved them, but you know, Hollywood would always show us a really um, narrow vantage point of what that time was like. You know, if you were a woman in the old west, you were always they. We always portrayed as subservient, subservient yeah. super subservient. If you were um, of color, and, and like any color woman, you were just subservient, and some kind of like. Uh, or you were not part of the story at all, right? You know, as much as we love, um, love Unforgiven, the Clint Eastwood movie. Every single woman in it is a prostitute. Like every single female character, and so, and so often, you um, you would see that that kind of narrative. And then uh, if you were of color. You were treated as you know less than human, or, or um, you were shown in such a stereotypical light, and and you get to a certain age where the scene almost gets gets spoiled by those, or the scene gets spoiled by those um, stereotypical tropes. And the, the older you get, you start wanting to see yourself in these in these movies, and you start asking questions like, okay, I live in a house full of women; they don't behave like these women in it. In the Western, um, uh, I live in the you know, I, I, where are the, the 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 black people, and and you you come across things like Wyatt Turp died. If you took a guess when he died, you'd probably say eighteen. He died in 1929. My grandmother was alive when Wyatt Earp was running around. Tombstone gunfight at OK Corral was in 1881. Well, that makes you think like the, the Emancipation Proclamation Act was in the 1860s. And even then, one in four cowboys, the name cowboy was given to people of color. Um, uh, other people were called cow hands. So where were the people of color? And you, you, know, you, you just read up on it and you find out all of this amazing information in all of these characters. And it just made me want to not reimagine the, the Old West. Hollywood reimagined it. I just wanted to broaden it and show women as actual humans and show like people of color as actual uh, people, not ex-slaves and not, you know, just kind of balance it out properly. Um, and yes. And if you don't mind, I will say Lassiter because there's two James. <laughs> um, um, the fact that I mentioned that the film restores and educates us, but primarily is so entertaining, your film. Was that something that you guys were aware of and were balancing? In the production? A hundred percent for me, because unlike James, I, I wasn't a huge fan of Westerns. But I, when I read something, I'm not reading for a genre. It's story. And his story was so entertaining. And then after meeting James, his vision for it was so bold and so entertaining that I, I, I tell James all the time, when I first read it, it was a love story. It was a story about unrequited love. It was this guy who loved this woman but couldn't commit to her until he resolved his demons and trauma. So that's what I was reading. So in itself, that story, I want to see. And then after hearing what James was going to do with the story, I was all the way in. The most entertaining love story I've ever read. <laughs> um, First of all, I'm sorry. Thank you guys for coming out this morning. I know this is absolutely. <laughs> At 9 a.m. Exactly. Uh, 9 a.m. Samuels, uh, James Samuels. Um, I grew up, we, we've established that, we've all seen Westerns, and it's black and white, good versus evil. You've created 
a, a film where, you know, it's not good versus evil. Um, you know, can you tell us about that approach? Yeah, um, the, you know, the, things I, the thing I love about um, Westerns, I always wanted to turn them on their, on their head and make it more um, real life-like. Um, you know, I grew up in the, in the hood I'm in West London, in, in Harrow Road, and, and we would have, like, elements of good versus, versus bad, but then at some point you look around and you look at your friends, and sometimes you're hang on a minute, we're all kind of outlaws. Like, if you... And if you look at, <laughs> if, if you look, like it happens from time to time, like, wow, okay, he's worse, but. <laughs> um, and if you, you know, for me, what's fascinating um, about The Harder They Fall and the story that we wanted to tell is the continuous cycle of violence we find ourselves um, in. It's so refreshing to be able to talk about the ending to people that have seen it. A man is chasing, is, is chasing another man for, because he executed his parents. When he meets the other man, he finds out that his parents executed his parents. Like, yeah. It's literally a loop. And, and I like playing with the, with the notion of, um, of why we, we class people as baddies, right? Why we, why we immediately say, he's a bad guy and he's a good guy. And immediately, you're, you see the Rufus Buck gang, but you're introduced to, to them as... as a murderous gang because we see young Nat Love's parents get get murdered. So immediately, okay, these are the these are the baddies. But we, if you actually look at the, the film, if you watch it again or or um, you analyze it, the first time we meet the Nat Love gang, they are executing people in cold blood mm -hmm. for just robbing a bank. Now, for all we know. The Crimson Hood Gang were the most polite bank robbers in the history of bank robbers. <laughs> they could have said, "Excuse me, guys," and they probably never even robbed the bank with guns. But they're getting executed in cold blood. Whereas when we meet the Rufus Buck Gang, they kill a bunch of soldiers on the train who are murderers and killed women and children to in a town to get silver. Correct. So really, like, on one hand, who's the baddies? And who's the goodies? Like, and I love, I love, um, I love. We grew up, we love westerns, right? So we love like the, the, the tropes, like bank robberies, train robberies, jailbreaks, quick draws. But when I do that, I want to kind of turn it on its head, give you what you're not expecting. Okay, countdown from five, five, four, <laughs> three. <laughs> Like, it's about who's alive and who's dead. So I, I want to kind of turn everything on its head. And that's one of the um, uh, exciting things about The Harder They Fall that, that um, made me want to tell that, tell that story and write that and, tale. And Lasseter, even within the, the group, um, you know, you have this g gangs going against each other. There's a camaraderie and there is a relationship amongst them mm -hmm. that I've, I don't recall seeing a film where you have this like respect and camaraderie, even opposites against each other. Well, well, there are two characters in the movie that kind of bring that together. It's Bass Reeves and it's Wiley Esco, who, who were in line in some kind of way with both sides. So those are, those are key characters that did that. But one thing I wanna say, uh, that James did that was really important. Um, each of these characters are based on people that lived. Um, th it's not their actual story. The story is, is fictionalized. The story is just um, James created in his brain. But it was important that if you look at each of these characters and go back and you research them, there's a, a person who lived and, and did something, even down to Cuffy, which I, I didn't find out until after the movie. Kathy Williams was a real person. Mm -hmm. Who dressed up a woman that dressed up like yeah, a man, yeah. right? And was in the yeah, army, it was in I army. believe. Yeah, yeah, the first woman enlisted. Um, so, uh, yes, to, I'll get that right. No, it's all right. So that element was was really important, and I think it was it was uh, something brilliant that James did. Um, and yeah, I think Bass Bass Reeves and and Wiley Esco are the characters that that brought both of the gangs and the elements together. Um, I, I, 
I'm going to jump ahead and the fact that there are so many incredible characters, but I was blown away by the production design. The fact of the, the, the three towns that we visit are a personality on their own. Um, and, and how did you arrive into just creating this three distinct, you know, we have the Redwood, which is like rich and opulent, and then we have this like loosey goosey middle town, and then Maysville is the white town. Um, can you talk about? Yeah, I, like I wanted Douglas Town where Mary is. That's like a uh, to me a home of like outlaws where outlaws go to to just chill and, and reside and uh, and it's opulent and rich. That's this Redwood, right? Red, Redwood, yeah. Redwood. Red and, and but when we first meet meet um, Nat Love and Mary, and she's performing, it's just like you know, this just 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 like a a oh, uh, uh, gully type Western town in the night. Then Redwood where Rufus Buck. And those guys reside. It's like the, they're trying to build a mecca, right, for the future of their people. They don't want to live in. And in the, we see fur, and we yeah. see leather, yeah. and color. Yeah, and, and I, I wanted it really colorful because we always think of the old west as like this old dusty place, but no American lived in the old west. It was the new frontier. It was the new America. They were living in the new west. We just call it the old west because we were making the movies decades. After so it was the old West, but when they were there, they were like technologically advanced <laughs> as far as they were concerned. Like, have you got the new Apple? Like, um, and then and then Maysville again. It's like me trying to wanting to turn everything on his head. He's like Maysville, that's a white town. So immediately we think of like white folks and white. I wanted a white town. <laughs> <Am I? laughs> and uh, and. Uh, and my production designer, his name's Martin Wist. He's a G. He did like Bad Times at the El Royale. But he did this movie called Cabin in the Woods with Drew, Drew Goddard. Remember Cabin in the Woods? And, yeah, of course. And how it was like the evil dead cabin. And then it turns into this mad sci fi thing. So I wanted him. I was like, I have to have uh, Martin Wist. And he kind of would just bring to life. I have a rule when I'm creating that obey your crazy, whether it's music, film, obey your crazy. And he would literally uh, bring to life all of the um, craziness in my, in my head. Incidentally, we got a call. Netflix was like the all, most awesome studio to <laughs> make this movie from because they let me just run, run, right. And then I had JL, like, whenever like, it would go too far, I had JL to talk to them. Like. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then one of them, uh, Kwame Parker, who was like overseeing the budget, he was like, James, you know, we think um, your appetite has grown a little bit. Because uh, there's stuff that isn't in the script, and it was Maysville, the white town. I said, I even want the ground white, right? So they had to import. And the horses <laughs> are <laughs> white. Watch this, right? So, 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 Kwame said, Kwame said, um, James, look, your appetite's growing. Kwame, I promise you, my, you know, when you put your hand on your heart, you know the person's lying. I promise you, I, my appetite has not grown, Kwame. It hasn't grown. At all. And he went, James, white horses? You want white horses? There's no white horses in New Mexico. I never said I want New Mexican white horses. But we got it. And I think like it's really um it's really effective. And also it makes you question yourself. Like, why do we assume it meant like white people? May as well, that's a white. And type. I adore the fact that Cuffy is in a bright red dress yeah. as she walks in. And yeah. And um, uh, I'm escaping on the main character. Nat he's, Love. Yeah. Nat Love, he's also wearing a red yeah. scarf. And, yeah. and it's so striking. Yeah, especially against the, against the um, whites. It's, just, it's a really um, fun, beautiful image. And it's just things that, that I would do in the film that um, I just don't really, I've never been fed, but I think I, I should have, I've always yearned for like the music that plays when they when they ride into that scene, right? It's um it's a a song with you hear Lauren Hill, uh, uh, rapping and she's singing and when she stops, the characters are actually whistling, the theme, the characters are like either, <whistles> like he's whistling the score that we just we just heard, like taking us into like a seamless, um, transition transition. So that whole scene was real fun for me to 
So, um, which leads me to a question I was going to bring up, Lassiter. Um, the expansive soundtrack of this movie, like every, I, I don't recall a movie where music, it's, it drives everything. The editing, the mood of the scene, it's all driven by music. And it's an expansive soundtrack. He mentioned uh, Lauren Hill, but we all also listened to Fela Kuti. And, and reggae, et cetera. Can you talk about buying into that vision? Well, James doesn't like to talk, but th this is going to be uh, <laughs> a, I'm so a, shy. A, a real question for him because all of the new music, uh, be it songs or score, was written and composed by James. So he did everything. Thank you, um, uh, so so a as a producer, like James had the whole movie in his head, and, and we spent a year and a half going over the script and the characters and everything. But there was another movie playing in James's head, which was the music. So I, I remember one day uh, I just said to James, "This isn't going to work." And he says, "What are you talking about?" I said, "It's not going to cut together. Trust me, this doesn't work." And he said, "Just listen to me. It will work." I said, "You have to explain it to me because what I'm seeing is we're wasting a day because." <laughs> the whole thing is going to be taken out. And, but what I didn't know is James is cutting the music as he's making the movie. So he knew the song and how the song and the score was going. It was, I had never seen anything like that, where you had this guy doing that many jobs on the movie. It was, it was, it was a testament to, to just his genius. And I'll, I'll, I'll let him talk about why he chose these songs. No, but before we get to there, how does it feel to, like, having said to him, no, this is not going to work, <laughs> and then all of a sudden... Once he explained it, I got it. You know, once he explained it, I was like, oh, that's brilliant. I had no idea that was, you know, when on the page, I had no idea that that's what he was thinking. But also, you know, like, um, JL is a, is a creative executive, right? So, like, he, I don't see... Um, J, like one of the movie that I'm doing next, he wrote. Like so, JL's like a, a creator, so he is. He's not a hot. It's not like explaining uh, uh, to like just a a regular <laughs> person. Like we'll be we'll be there like cooking up uh, dope ideas, and and also his background is is music, right? Um, as well as obviously we, all the films we know him for. But he was managing Will Smith. Since the beginning of his career, yeah, Albert which is Brooke. which is absolutely nuts. So there's there was no area that I was going to um, artistically that JL um, couldn't couldn't meet me. But it was just things like, okay, um, when we think of westerns, I always I try to be really quick with this guy. I know we're well on the clock. I always categorize westerns by the music. Mm -hmm. um, that's behind them. So if you look at the, the old, uh, if you look at Rio Bravo with John Wayne and, 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 and Dean Martin, Dean Martin right? yeah. and you remember when Dean Martin's in jail and he, he says, by the dawn, love the river, that's the way I long to be, in the river, just my rifle, my pony, and me. My rifle, my pony, and me, right? So that's that kind of, that, <laughs> that music un, under, under, is the underpin of that type of, of Western. And then they took a trip to Italy, right? And Ennio Morricone would give uh, uh, Sergio Leone, ding, 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 yeah. ding, ding, ding. <laughs> so when I was doing this, this um, film, I wanted to give the harder they fall, its own signature, right? Its own, and people would, would say, you know, you've put modern music under, um, you know, these Western visuals, but Jesse James and Billy the Kid never heard of anything called the electric guitar. <laughs> when, so that was modern music then. When Dean Martin, like Jesse James never even heard of electricity. <laughs> when, 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 when Dean Martin was saying, my rifle, my pony and me, or the music for Rawhide or Bonanza, dun, 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 dun. you wouldn't have gone to the Old West and walked up to, to, to uh, Billy the Kid and gone, have you heard that new song? It was always modern music. So I just wanted to give this, and, and, and I would just think of music from my childhood, like Barrington Levy singing, here I come, I'm broader than Broadway. It's the Liadli, Liadli. I'm like, that's galloping. 
ever since I was a kid, I'll hear that and say, that's galloping mm. under there. Say, Liadli, Liadli, Liadli. So when I grew up, when I, and I'll tell you something real funny, right? When I, when I grew up and became a man, I started making, me, making music, I was like, I want Barrett and Levy. I'm gonna repurpose that particular joint. I'm gonna have it as score. And I want Barrington Levy. But he's in Jamaica. How can I get hold of Barrington Levy? And I went on Instagram. You know, some people don't really understand that if you put your actual details into Instagram, it's gonna come up on your, and it said call on his Instagram page. <laughs> Click. <laughs> That's a Jamaican dial. You're like, Hello? <laughs> Barrington, I'm making a movie. I actually grabbed him from Instagram and put him on the, on the score, but uh, <laughs> the whole, but the whole thing was was like an exciting. Yeah, but it's beyond just grabbing this music. But you, the the rhythm of the film, the editing feeds into the the music, Absolutely. which I don't I don't recall a western that is so music driven. Yeah. yeah. And, Absolutely, but I just think, for me, like the pace, you know, you and I, we love Westerns, and then we meet so many people that don't like Westerns, as JL said, it's not like he didn't like it, but he wasn't a fan of. <laughs> Poor JL. <laughs> oh, but so many people, like the biggest contention in my marriage was that my wife didn't like Westerns, and I try and show her so many. And she just, she just did not like Westerns. I just don't like him, James, but watch this one. And she just doesn't care. And the reason, and it's not that people don't like Westerns. To me, if you like film, you like film. Yeah. It's that you're not being fed the nutrients and the vitamins you need to be fed. Because there's no such Vitamins. Th yeah. <laughs> vitamins. <laughs> I like I say nutrients. Tomato, you say tomato. <laughs> like, you're not being fed the <laughs> vitamins. Um, uh, you need and and vitamins <laughs> <laughs> and then the vitamins when in Rome and and so the, the, just with regards to um, a Western just means a particular time and place right it could be any story but if you said it in like eighteen eighteen you you're in a particular geographical space on Earth then it's a then it's a Western there's there's cowboys and so with this film I wanted to um, to give it the pace of our personalities today and, and the rhythm of of our personalities. And for me, music and film are one. Three acts in a in a screenplay. There's three acts in a in a song. It's like two verses and a and a middle eight. Um, and you know, obviously we can bend the rules and do different things with them, but they're pretty much exactly the same thing. When I'm writing a, a script, I'm also coming up with score and 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 melodies, and it's all kind of like one. A uh, uh, long thing for me, and I think that's why um, everything speaks to each other. Just m music and film and score and song, and they kind of all um, are woven together together seamlessly. Because I, for me, it's just one um, cohesive, uh, melodic, dramatic thought. J Amazing. Um, JL, um, all of these characters: Bass Reeve, he mentioned Cherokee Bill. Um, lived, you know, and, and, but anachronistically they're blended into this film. Um, can you tell us about the logic behind bringing in all these people that actually lived, but in the, in the same time zone at the same time? Um, th that's just how the, the story was constructed. I, I think, uh, Part of what James was trying to do is just educate people about these people, uh, just to give them some shine, just for us to go do some research on, on Bass Reeves. The rumor is that the Lone Ranger is actually based on Bass Reeves' character, on, on Bass Reeves' life. Um, and as you dig into it, you, you start to see how important these characters were, how vital they were in the Old West. Um, the Jim Beckworth character I've seen in a couple of television shows and a couple of movies, and he's always white. But the but the but the real guy was black. So, um, part, other than just being entertaining, I think for this film, what it also does, it provides some historical context, and I and I think that was yeah. Really but important. like something like Cherokee Bill, the fact that he's a Native American and and African American, 
and we've never seen that right. in 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 Western films, but it it, it was there. It sure. it happened. The importance of that. Absolutely, I, I think um, uh, obviously Hollywood done a number on on <laughs> on us. Um, <laughs> just, just uh, back in the day from the Tarzan movies to, you know what I mean? But you um, know what? That's okay. Yeah. It's just an opportunity for us to, yeah. to right that wrong. Absolutely. And, and that's what we'll do. Restore it. And, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I, th I think um, for me, it was uh, fun to take, it's almost like, Heavenly Father. I'll be your messenger. <laughs> right? yeah. Like it was fun. Like to like. Okay, what happens if you take Bass Reeves and Cherokee Bill? Like Cherokee Bill in real life was such a badass, right? He um, when he was going to his his hanging, they said any last words in real life, and he went last words. I came here to die, not make a speech. <laughs> guy, how can we never seen this dude? But I know all the words to. Um, Calamity Jane, uh, Doris Day's Windy City. I just got back from the Windy City. The Windy City is mighty pretty, but they ain't got what we got. No siree. They got stacks up seven stories. Never need any morning glory. I know all the words to Windy City, but I've never learned about Stagecoach Mary or, or Gertrude Smith or uh, Bill Pickett. I've never learned about these people. So, um, you know, it's an honor to, to bring them all in one place at one time so people can stop saying that these people existed. And I... I I want to ask you about Cuffy, the the her her the fact that she's her gender, and it, it, to me, it's so incredible that she dresses like a man, not not to hide. She's actually it's a form of expression, and and who she is. You know, can you talk about bringing that that character in? F for me, um, the first concert I ever went to, um, my brother took me, I think I was like 10, was Prince um, Love Sexy Tour. Mm. And I watched Prince do a full show wearing a skirt, high heels, suspenders, and like l like nothing. And it's just, it's just Prince, right? Every single person that is around today, every type of personality, they they lived back then like Kath, the real Cathay Williams. She's the first um, uh, woman in the in the U.S. Army, but she enrolled as a man, and they thought um, she was a man called William Cathay, right? And um, I just think that for me it was important to show the full or as wide a range as possible of our personalities and and what. Um, what was then, as is now, as was then. Like I just, I really just wanted to um, wanted to show it. And also, I, I wanted, to, I didn't want the women um, in this movie to be like bogged down by like sexuality, right? They're just G's. Like the men, are, you see all the men in this in this. We're not talking about turning everything on its head. All the men in this in this um, uh, film. They fight with guns, and it's the two women that throw the guns away and duke it out with fists. <laughs> like, they're just G's. Like, where's our G's? How could you? And and for me, if you remove women from the story, whether it's a Cuffy type character or Trudy Smith or Stage Up Mary, if you remove women and their personalities from uh, a story, you haven't even got a story. Like, it's just bad storytelling. And if you remove, you know, if you remove uh, people of color, again, you've just removed, you just removed someone. If you take a brick away from a house, the whole foundation is, is, is um, faulty. I'll conclude by saying, you can have the best car in the world, you could be driving a Bugatti, but if you remove a wheel, you got <laughs> the worst car on the planet. How can you remove women from the, from what's the Old the, West? What's the line in the script? And, and this kind of defines Cuffy to me. Because Cuffy's not pretending. Yeah. She, she's not hiding. She's not pretending no, to be man. something. What was the line in the script that Cuffy said when she got confronted? Man's ignorance. And, oh, yeah, that was, yeah, in the, in the script, uh, uh, he said, um, Nat Love walks on, on Cuffy. Uh, she's taking a, taking a pee, right? And she's, she's bending down. He doesn't say anything to her. He just says, does Mary know? And Cuffy 
listen, ain't nothing I hide. Man's ignorance informs man's assumption. Like, it's just the ignorance of, you know, it's just the ignorance of men. Cuffy's not pretend. And also, those corsets, and all, that's mad uncomfortable. <laughs> Some men are walking around with chaps and, like, the most comfortable clothes imaginable. And they got women all... Cuffy, in, in this movie, she dresses the way she dresses because she's a G. She, you know, by the time you find out whatever her sexual preference is, you have a bullet in your <laughs> cranium. So she takes out two people at once. And I love Cuffy. But also, and then on the other end, you have Trudy that I love the fact that she's badass, but she also enjoys dressing up like a woman. And the, the, the gamut between the three women in the story is just fantastic. But that's the way women are. Like, because who makes these, these rules, right? In, in real life, I only wear perfume. I don't wear aftershave, right? <laughs> and um, uh, like, who, who, what scientist said man has to smell like jungle? Like, I don't, like who? <laughs> that guy's probably never spoken to a woman in his life. Like, do you like this? <laughs> so, like, who makes who makes these rules? A woman has to look a cer certain way. Like Trudy Smith wears a bowler hat. To me, her bowler hat signifies the, her owning and dominance over what you regard, what we regard as a man's world, is mine. While wearing a dress and and being as badass as as um. She is, and incidentally, th those are the women I know. They just, I grew up like, uh, there's no point in history where women have been subservient. There's no point in history where black people, there's literally no point in history where black people were slaves. They were enslaved. It's total different, totally different. And, and, and you know, when we, when we teach these tropes to, to kids, when we teach these, these um, these tropes and these kind of like narrow um, beliefs to kids. We gr we grew up with these narrow points of points of view, and then we wonder why why we've got still got so much work to do just with basic communication and, and not insulting each other. You, you've been taught your whole life your your the your the your ancestors were slaves. It like, has an effect on you. Or women have to be like this, and you know, to me. Um, I just don't believe in it, any of those things, and I, I wouldn't want to tell a story that enforces them. Um, JL, we talked about a lot about the westerns we grew up with, and and I adore things like Once Upon a Time in America, where I mean Once Upon a Time in the West, where there was a, this all-star cast mm -hmm. of great actors and the Magnificent Seven with you know Yul Brynner, etc. Um, you have an all-star cast of incredible African-American actors Thank in you. it. You. you know, what was it like for you assembling this all-star cast? Um, you know, I, I think Idris and, and Regina were the linchpin. And, and once James had Idris, I think you always had Idris. Yeah. You always thought yeah. of this movie for, yeah. for, for Idris. And once we got Regina, um, and, and the way that James got Regina to do the film is not only by the script, because a, a lot of these actors, the reason that they're good actors is about the material leads it, you know, the, the story, uh, the, the word on the page is, is what gets them. But we also had um, the fortune of, fortune of having James. So getting James on the phone with these actors and his passion and his vision just made everybody want to be a part of this. And, and that was the attitude on the set. By, by the way, as, as many of you know, every movie is a miracle. It's, it's a mini miracle. I, and I, even, even though we're in it as producers and making it, when we come up of the, out of the other side, I'm just always floored by these hundreds, sometimes thousands of people just through some alchemy did their own thing and use their craft and use their skill, and then we come come up with a movie. Um, but um, and and but this this one it was a miracle inside of a miracle because we did it during COVID, and it was I mean <laughs> like you know they, they growing up when I used to read books on making film they'll say you know there's this thing called Murphy's Law, whatever can go wrong will go wrong. <laughs> Let me tell you something, man. Murphy caught 
COVID-19 and died. <laughs> that thing is called COVID's law. And COVID is this whole other creature that manipulates your every decision. COVID co-directed this movie. It's like, <laughs> we're like, me and COVID were like the Coen brothers. <laughs> like, like, like it, it was the craziest, um, the craziest things. And also just watching what happened as a result of COVID, like we were all stuck in Santa Fe for months, no filming. JL became addicted to the Great British Bake Off and no, became no. like, <laughs> became like this bacon connoisseur. <laughs> like, look what I can make. And then, and then, like, it was the, it was literally just the craziest, the craziest. And also, at, at that time, the coronavirus was new, right? So Netflix took every single precaution. So imagine my my mindset. I'm going to direct my debut feature film, and I'm. Prepared, and I'm prepared for everything. You throw any decision, anything that can go wrong, I'm ready for it. And then you're told you have to wear face masks now, and goggles, and a face shield, and you can't stand closer than six, um, closer than six feet to any actor. This is, all my brain was like, this isn't madness, this is Sparta. <laughs> <laughs> like, this was, it was, it was, it was liter literal, um, li literally um, crazy, but then you know we find a way to we find a way to do it and still have fun in the process. And I know I'm not answering any of your questions. The, to bring it home, it was because of these actors that we got it done. Not not only are they fantastic artists, but they were they were down for the ride. They were down for the cause. Just quarantined amongst us, following the rules, getting tested every day, driving up to that set every day. It was so much anxiety. First, they take your temperature. Then you have to get a rapid test. And then three days a week, you have to get a PCR test. And then you just go back and think, is today going to be the day? Like, all of that on top of trying to do your job. It, it was a miracle that we got through it. On top of, at that time, yeah, anyone here has seen this um, John Carpenter movie, The Thing? Yeah. When that thing's in your blood and you don't know. Yeah. So you'd be speaking to someone you're super close with, but you don't know if they've got. <laughs> remember, it was new. Yeah. <laughs> you don't know if they've got the thing that thing that is just jumping out and and killing me. So even for the actors, they couldn't even have the camaraderie. That, That's right. But it just it made us kind of all um, all closer and and um, uh, you know somehow we pulled together and, and we got through it. Each. Each of these characters, I could see a film just strain from from them, whether it's Cherokee Bill or Cuffy or or Buzz Reeves. It's like they're so delineated. Is that something that you always intended for them to have their own universe brought in together, carefully delineated? Absolutely, I wanted to like introduce the cowboy cinematic universe, <laughs> where, like where um, where you know all of these characters. Whether you know I go back and do prequels and you know um, uh, some like maybe a series and you know um, stuff that myself, JL, and Jay Z have always um, spoken about. I wanted to introduce. There's so much uncharted um, territory within that time period and that playground that we grew up loving. There's so much uh, uh, scope um, that I wanted, I wanted things to, which is why I end the movie the way I do. Like I, I want um, uh, to continue uh, those adventures and yeah, and, and just, just bring me, I'll always go um, venture into the old west. Even if only just to show my wife, I told you, you love westerns. <laughs> She's watched this movie about 20 times. Every time Lakeith comes on, she's like, <gasps> <laughs> and, and, and one thing I want to add, I'm so happy that you guys got to watch it in, in this environment on the screen because that's, that's how we shot it with the intention that you could see the scope and, and, and really see the, the, the care and craft that went into it. Yeah, um, and JL, the, we, you know, we mentioned Jay-Z by passing, but his involvement, you know, Sean Carter's involvement in the film, you know, can you talk about it, it? You know, it wasn't music. It was story, it was um, casting, it, it was doing what a real producer does. And, and Jay brought me into the project. Um, even though I had known James for a long time, this was something that Jay and James connected on and 
Jay called me and said, you know, let's do this. Let's help James do this. But he was involved all along the way. He, uh, unfortunately, because of COVID, he couldn't join us because he has young kids and yeah. he, he couldn't go to New Mexico. But um, he's super involved in the marketing now and just, just come, you know, a great partner. Well, it, it, on a surface level, it's such an entertaining film. It's so powerful, and, and thank you for not only entertaining us, for, but for educating us and restoring um, history uh, with this film. And thank you for being here, the two of you. It's been oh, a thank delight. You. Thank you guys, thank you this is so much fun. Thank you, my brother. Of course. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you guys.